Rabbi Susan, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so very much again for your time. Thanks. Thank you. So you're an amazing fellow, not just because of what I've read in terms of your bio, but you're a remarkable fellow because of our personal connection. And in fact, I owe a great deal of the work that we have been privileged to undertake to you. So can you just go back before we get into some of the more formal aspects of our conversations and talk to me a little bit about how it was that you and I crossed paths. You were based in the United Kingdom. I'd like to know a bit more about that. I'd like to share that with the, with the audience. Yes, so that, was, that must have been uh, quite some years ago when I was stationed uh, at, the, at a base uh, in north of Leeds. And uh, I met you there um, at one of the communities. And I think that uh, we felt that we had something in common, uh, which is not only our uh, faith background, of course, and our love for, for the state of Israel, but also the military background. And uh, I think that's really where we started to, to connect and then kind of uh, compare notes. Uh, and I remember your, your talk uh, there uh, at the time, which was very impressive. And it was probably the beginning, I, I can imagine, of your illustrious uh, work and, and your very important work that you're still conducting right now. So it, for, for the people who are listening and watching this, I want them to know that it literally was the beginning of it. And I'll take everyone a little bit behind the scenes and share with them one anecdote from that. I was invited for my first ever talk to the great displeasure of the audience, Rabbi, to speak at the United Hebrew Congregation in Shadwell Lane in Leeds in the UK. And I was terribly, terribly nervous. It was a Friday night. There were probably about 20 people there, if that. You were one of them, and your son, Josh, about whom we'll speak in due course, was another one of the congregants. And I was trembling so badly that I actually couldn't hold the glass of water and drink from it because of nerves. I, I still am somewhat scared of public speaking. And you saw that, you noticed that, and you came up to me and you said, listen, what I want you to do is when you take to the podium, I want you to look to the far left corner of the room and to the far right corner of the room. I will be in the far left corner and I will place my son Josh in the far right corner. And every time that you rotate your head left and right, you will see us nodding back at you doing exactly this in agreement. And that will carry you through the nerves. Do you remember that? Of course, I do remember that. Yes. And it absolutely works. How did you perceive that? And how did you know to come forward and to help me in a time of great, great anxiety, quite frankly? Uh, <laughs> you know, I can't, I, I, I just felt, uh, you know, I just felt that uh, um, I had some advice to give as being, you know, being a public speaker myself, as a rabbi, of course. I have to speak, and as a chaplain, I have to speak all the time in public, and uh, it was not always easy. And I had always I felt that this was a great technique to have someone in the audience that encourages you, uh, because you know when you speak, sometimes you're in the synagogue and you don't have anyone, or you're anywhere, and you speak too long. What happens is people start nodding off or looking at their watch, <laughs> right. and that can really throw you off, right? You have a thought in your mind, you want to go on, and then you see someone looking at his watch or even closing his eyes, that can really throw you off. So that's why I you know, recommend if you have those support uh, um, you know, persons around to always do, do this kind of technique because the encouragement is really what takes you forward. It did, it carried me through, I remember it as it was yesterday and I've actually passed that on to a great many people who suffer from the same anxiety now. I, I, I just wanted people to understand that we're friends that we know one another and we have the privilege of knowing, I know your children and I know your wife, Amy, of course, and, and, and you, of course, know my dear parents and my siblings. And it's because of that that I'm so very pleased to chat to you because this gives me a chance to learn in front of an audience a little bit more about you in terms of your professional background. So let, let's start with this. You're a U.S. Army chaplain. You're an Orthodox Jew. Is that, that right? What, what denomination would you place yourself into? So that's right. So I grew up in an Orthodox household, as you would, you would consider it, a modern Orthodox uh, household. But you know, when people ask me today, what are you? Are you Reformed? Are you Conservative Orthodox? 
My answer today is I would say I am army Jewish. So that's its own kind of brand, I think, because in the military, I have learned that you have to be accommodating uh, much more so than in a regular Jewish community. Because if you are in a Jewish community, your congregants know what to expect of you, may that be an Orthodox or Reform community, and you know kind of what your community expects of you. But as a chaplain and as a Jewish chaplain, you have to be accepting and accommodating to a whole range of Jewish beliefs and traditions. So I have, uh, I think to coin it army Jewish, uh, instead of any of the other labels that would probably fit, fit my you know, description best. I, I think that's remarkable and rarely does anybody hear that. Army Jewish, it sounds like the title actually of your next book, perhaps post-service <laughs> rabbi, if I can suggest it. But you come from a very strong academic background. In fact, it looks through leafing through your resume that academia might have been your pathway, that you were considering a life in the institution of academia. And here you are, a U.S. Army chaplain. Can you tell us exactly how that happened? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, but you're right. I mean, my parents still today, they wonder why I haven't become a lawyer or, you know, something more suited to, to a good uh, you know, Jewish um, career. So what happened really, yes, I was in academia and I still, you know, dream sometimes of, of academia. That was my path. Uh, I, I went to Sussex, as you mentioned there, to England to do a PhD in uh, Jewish history. I was especially interested in Jewish history before the Holocaust, mm -hmm. before uh, everything um, you know, was destroyed in Germany, and, and I was mostly interested in the, the reaction of the Jewish Germans or the German Jews to the, the increasing Holocaust. So my field was looking at the academic sphere. Uh, how did the Jewish intellectuals deal with this? What did they do to try to defend themselves? Because there was this belief at the time, you know, if we only get the upper classes on our side, if they can influence the rest, then you know, we save the day. Um, so the, of course, the, the street anti-Semitism was very difficult to combat. I mean, how do you do that? You can't really uh, face a majority as a, such a small minority, and it wasn't the Jewish way anyway. So their idea was really to, to look at intellectual, academic ways to convince the, Jew, uh, the non-Jewish um, intellectuals of the, the um, worth of Jewish culture. But that's, you see, I'm going already too far into academia. No, this is but fascinating. This, 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 this was my interest. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely fascinating, Rabbi, because in fact, it's not academic at all. This is, this is not a dynamic that exists in the vacuum, the sometimes vacuous state of academia. This is real and it's present today. A lot of members of American Jewry, for example, feel a sharp rise in anti-Semitism. British Jewry, felt a very sharp rise in anti-Semitism that they attempted to combat with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn, that they att attempted to combat by influencing the very top levels of those in the United Kingdom. And it failed. It seemed to have failed as a model. Did you see any repetitions or overturns of what you studied prior to the Holocaust of the, that, that was the hallmark of the Second World War? at play today and were you frustrated by seeing that and perhaps wondering why could others not see it? Mm. I mean there, there are some you know some similarities to a certain degree that I do uh, observe. Um, one of them being unfortunately the fact that there's not not much has changed with all the effort that was invested to combat anti-semitism. Um, really not much has changed in Germany and I don't know how successful British Jewry was. I mean it's great what has been done and I applaud everything uh, that has been done, but uh, it, it remains to be seen if anything fundamental will be changed within the Labour Party in, in Great Britain. Uh, another fascinating comparison that I'm still kind of pondering is the reaction of Jewish students then and today. Um, you know, in, in many ways, a similar situation. Uh, Weimar Germany was uh, a very anti-Semitic uh, place and anti-Semitic time, and Jewish students were very often excluded from joining those uh, fraternities and other organizations 
So they had to organize themselves and, and create their own uh, organizations. But many of them were alienated as well and afraid to stand up to this uh, rising anti-Semitism and decided to um, assimilate in many ways. Of course, it wasn't possible to the degree it is today. So before we come back to your career, would you agree? Because I, I feel that when people speak about the rise of anti-Semitism, a lot of people are, are laying themselves bare to the accusation that they're sowing panic. I personally don't feel there can be another Holocaust because of the existence of the State of Israel. So things can get bad, they can get challenging, they must be combated at the source quickly, swiftly and decisively. But I don't believe that we're moving towards a Holocaust under any circumstance in any dynamic, so long as there's the state of Israel. Would you agree with that, based on your study? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I would fully agree with that. So it's anti-Semitism that should be feared. It's not another Holocaust, in other words. Agreed. So, Rabbi, let's come now to your military service. How did that come about? So, very simple, actually, although it looks like a, a, a stretch. Uh, looking back. So I was just completing my PhD in history and uh, very excited to publish my first book. And uh, I went back to Heidelberg where I um, studied law before and, and also Jewish studies. And uh, when I was in Heidelberg, I was in contact with um, a lot of American Jewish chaplains because Heidelberg at the time was a huge Ameri American garrison. It was NATO headquarters Europe. And there were 10,000s of American soldiers stationed at any given time uh, in Heidelberg. And they always, there was always a Jewish chaplain there. So for me, this was a very fascinating um, environment. And I would always like to go Friday evenings to the, the American chapel. And uh, I was kind of um, impressed with the way that the American Jewish chaplains, and especially the Orthodox ones, how they were able to do this military Judaism and, and to convey um, their thoughts and their care really to a whole congregation of diverse people, of diverse Jews. Um, so that was it. I, I knew American Jewish chaplains, but never in a million years did I think that I would end up as one. So fast forward now, 2001, I went back to Heidelberg to visit some uh, friends of mine. Um, and when I was in Heidelberg, it happened to be Purim. So on Purim, I went to the synagogue, of course, which uh, I helped build. I, I used to be the, I was the chairman of the Jewish community in Heidelberg, and I was able to build a synagogue. So I went back there, and on Purim, a Jewish chaplain, actually, an American Jewish chaplain happened to be there as well, whom I had known for many years, and I didn't know he was back in Germany. At the time, he was the senior Jewish chaplain in Europe, something similar to what I am today. Right. Um, and uh, he looked at me and he said, so what are you doing now? And we started chatting. I said, well, I just did this academia. and great. And I'm so excited. I'll, I'll publish this book and I'll, I'll do this and that and all these great ideas. And then he looks at me and said, listen, you have smicha. You have an ordination, a rabbinic ordination, right? And I said, yeah, I do. I do. And I go sometimes to communities here and there. He said, why don't you become an army chaplain? And I looked at him and I said, you know, I know it's Purim today, and Purim is supposed to be jolly and make jokes and all this, but that goes too far, and I was just laughing it off. That's not going to happen. I have no right. connection. Well, I do have a connection. My wife is originally from Philadelphia, but I had never been to the States before. We met in Europe. Mm. So I had no connection to America other than my wife being American. Um, I had no intention to become an American or putting on the uniform or anything else, so I kind of laughed it off and left it at that. And of course, the same year, 2001, 9-11 happened. And when that happened, I was just in the process of getting a, an academic position, which was not 100% at the time, but I was hoping for it. And when that happened, my first reaction was, I said to my wife, Amy, I said, do you remember we talked to, to Ken, to the chaplain? Thank God I'm not in the army. Now, that was my very first reaction because everyone saw what happened and was shocked. And after a day or so when we talked it over, we both felt that this may be a sign that I should support the U.S. Army. Because for me, even as a European, but as a Jew, 
the American army was still the symbol of our liberation in the end during World War II. And I felt this moral uh, urge almost to support if I can. And, and I felt, well, if I can become an American chaplain, if I can help the American soldiers um, in, in this difficult path that was about to come, then I should, I should take this opportunity, this once in a lifetime opportunity for me to, to pay my dues, so to speak, and support the U.S. Army. And I called Ken Line one, I called him up and I said, Ken, let's talk. Uh, I think I want to do this. Uh, and how, how ready were they to accept you, your volunteerism to the U.S. Army at that time? How, how in need were they of, of a chaplain, for example? Well, I remember Colonel Leinwand, he said, he, we sat together and he said, listen, listen, uh, I, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, you want to volunteer, but I have to tell you, something's going to happen and you may have to go to places. And uh, I mean, he was in a way anticipating what would happen, of course, with the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. And, uh, but he was, he was excited. He said, look, if you really, you and Amy, you both are sure about this, um, we can make it happen, we can help you. So at the time, of course, this was at the time when the email and so forth was not as uh, common as it is today. And uh, you know, everything was done over the phone with a recruiter in the States and by fax. And I got a fax machine and faxed back and forth all these documents that I had to sign. And they were FedExed back and forth for a couple of weeks um, until I finally signed everything and the recruiter called me up and said, uh, Mr. Susan, because at the time I was a mister, uh, Mr. Susan, uh, you forgot to put down your social security number on the documents. And I said, well, I don't have one. And he was like, oh my God, I completely forgot about that. So with the social security number, it's interesting. You can do everything else. You can get a green card and this and that and the other, but you have to be physically in the U.S. to get a social security number. So overnight, I had to fly to the States. I stayed there for two nights only. Um, went to Delaware, got a social security number, came back, and uh, was able to fill out the documents. And only a couple of weeks later, I went into the next class that formed, the chaplain's class, um, in April. It was in April 2002. I got on a plane and uh, was on my way to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to basic training. Mm -hmm. And it was a long flight, I could tell you that. It was right. a long flight. And there were a couple of moments on that flight I was thinking, was that the right decision now or not? Right. And, and that, that's an incredible story. So you, you joined the U.S. Army. I, well, let me give a bit of context. I remember as a child looking at recruitment adverts on television for the British Armed Forces. And what they were advertising was, frankly, an opportunity to travel the world, mm -hmm. to see new places, camaraderie, and a solid, secure career. And all of that changed after September 11th. Then the recruitment ads took on an entirely different turn. So you joined the US Army with a clear assessment internally, having been made, that you might be deployed. And you might be deployed, in fact, you were told that you would most likely be deployed into a combat zone. You didn't know what that would look like. And despite that, you said, I have to go. Now. Why is that? Why did you say, I should go, I must go? Because the reason I ask this question is, I went through a similar process. When I volunteered for service in the Israel Defense Forces, I remember laying in bed and asking myself, what if I, not, not particularly wondering what if I'm killed in action or I die there in a combat zone, what if I lose an arm or a leg or my sight or my faculties? How, am I really prepared to go through the rest of my life with those sorts of injuries and difficulties and challenges? And ultimately, I made the decision that the cause was worth it and that I would go. How did you come to that decision? Yeah, I think, I think part of the answer um, I mentioned, it, it, it was the, uh, the feeling that here is a, a unique situation, a historical moment in time where the only superpower that we can rely on as Jews and as Israelis is being attacked. And they are in need of support. That's how I felt. I mean, I didn't feel like I would save the world, but I knew that there was a dearth of Jewish chaplains uh, within the U.S. Army. There was a sharp drawdown, of course, after Vietnam and so forth. And then in the Clinton era, 
the military again was uh, drawn down. So there was a need, a, a uh, concrete need for Jewish chaplains and for chaplains in general to support those young men and women who would go into combat. So yes, of course, there's always this concern that an injury may happen or, or death and so forth, but you do weigh that as you said yourself, you do weigh it and you, in the end the, of your calculation, uh, you realize that the greater good and, and really the cause that you stand for and that um, you're willing to support is, is more important than your personal you know, intentions. It's incredible, isn't it? And, and I think many people go a lifetime without any such sensation, frankly, in terms of their day-to-day -day activities. So, so what, what year did you move to Kuwait, Rabbi? I, I, I want to come to that. When did that happen? You were deployed to Kuwait. So my, my deployment was actually right out of uh, where we met, after we met there in uh, Leeds. Um, it was in 2008. Mm -hmm. so 2008, I was detached from my unit in the UK, and it was during the time of the so-called surge. So yes. a lot of uh, people were sent uh, to the Middle East at the time. Of course, Iraq and Afghanistan were still hot spots. That was General so David Reyes, who was heading up this surge to beat back the insurgents at the time, right? Exactly. Yes, that was his time, exactly. So uh, being the only Jewish chaplain in the Middle East at the time, because we had so few in general, um, I was placed strategically um, to, to be in Kuwait. And from there, I would be called. So if ever there was something going on in Iraq that they, they desperately needed a Jewish chaplain or they just needed a Jewish chaplain, they would call me or in Afghanistan. So I would go back and forth um, from those places. Because I remember that time. The reason I asked you to, to date it was that I remember seeing you in, in Leeds in the UK. I was there visiting family. I'd already moved to Israel. And I remember you telling me you're being deployed over to Kuwait. So what sort of atmosphere did you step into, did you arrive at? And can you tell us some of the aspects of, of ministering and being a chaplain over there in, in wartime? By the way, I'd like you to do so while tying in not the politics, because I know you can't do that, but the criticism that surrounds, frankly, any theatre of war in the homeland. What Did people feel that over there? Were you not sensing that over there? What were your experiences as a, as a chaplain? So, so maybe I should uh, preface this by talking a little bit about the role of the American chaplain. It's very different from the role in, in, uh, of chaplains in other armies. For instance, um, the Jewish chaplain really is not a Jewish chaplain. He is, but he is not. I remember my very first unit when I came to my, um, to my first battalion, I spoke to my commander first, and he said, look, chaplain, I want you to introduce yourself to, to the troops. They, you know, a new chaplain, they need to know you. Um, and I did. And one of the things that he appreciated in my speech, my, my first uh, speech to the troops, I told him, I said, listen, guys, I am a Jewish. I'm, a, I'm Jewish. I told him I'm Jewish. You can see that. I have a kippah, even in uniform, and you can see it from the symbol here that I'm Jewish. But I don't want you to see me as a Jewish chaplain. I said, I'm not a Jewish chaplain. I'm an American army chaplain. Because the majority of the troops are not Jewish. And that's really the role of the American chaplain. Yes, I do minister to Jewish troops, but mainly I do that on a Friday evening. I do a Shabbat service during the Chagim. I do, of course, Yom uh, Noahim and Pesach and all the other Chagim. But that's really only 10% maybe of my work. 90% of my work deals with taking care of people, and that's all people. So all people come to me as the only person really in the U.S. Army system that can guarantee 100% confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So any soldier can come to me and tell me whatever it is. It can even be of a criminal nature, and I will not divulge this information. So that's why they come to me. So I deal a lot with marriage counseling, um, with you know, personal issues, with uh, life coaching, uh, financial issues, whatever it may be. That's what I deal with. Mm -hmm. And the best um, way to, to really explain how that plays out was that a couple of weeks after I gave that first speech to the troops and I said, hey, I'm here, I'm an American chaplain, I'm not a Jewish chaplain necessarily only. 
I had a young soldier who came to me and he was uh, maybe 19 years old. And uh, he said, chap, I need to talk to you. Can I come and make an appointment? Of course. So he came and I, said, I asked him what's going on. So he told me this story. He said, um, sir, I'm a Catholic you know, soldier. I, I grew up Catholic, altar boy and everything. My parents are very religious. Been in the army for over a year now and I haven't seen my parents. I'm going back next week. Mm -hmm. I'm terrified mm -hmm. because I lost all faith in God and I'm afraid they will notice that I don't believe in the Catholic Church anymore. I want you to help me. So, in this situation, we were taught at the chaplain school, there is a term, we call it provide and perform. I provide Jewish rites and rituals. I, I, sorry, I, I perform Jewish rites and rituals, but I will provide for a soldier who is not of my faith group by connecting him with a chaplain of his faith background. Mm -hmm. So whenever it comes to faith issues, I will not get involved. I'm not going to do a Christian service or Christian sacraments, of course. And if it's a, a, a Christian or a non-Jewish question, I will refer to my Christian colleagues. So that's what I wanted to do. I picked up the phone and I said, okay, just hang tight. I know Father Thomas. The Catholic priest, we went to basic training together. He's a great guy, and he'll talk to you. Let me give him a call, and we'll make an appointment together. The young soldier looked at me, and he said, I don't want you to call Father Thomas. I don't know Father Thomas. I know you. You're my chaplain. I want you to help me. What an incredible story. What an incredible story. So, so this, this was a very, you know moving moment for me as well. It was a difficult moment because, of course, I don't know how many rabbis had to help a, uh, a Christian, you know, young person to go back to church and convince them that the Catholic Church has some good sides. But right. that's exactly what I had to do right. to, right. to try to help him to find his way back. And when you tell us that you spoke about marriage counseling and financial anxieties and other sources of, uh, of discomfort. What was it like dealing with other priorities that must have come to the fore during wartime? PTSD, trauma from the battlefield, loss of friends, even loss of faith as a result of a trauma. How was that, Rabbi? Yeah, I mean, that was very, very difficult, of course. Uh, it was difficult, um, as you can imagine. Um, and unfortunately, because I was, um, they, they, call, they call the Jewish soldiers uh, low density, high demand, LDHD, low density, high demand. So there's low, we have, there are quite a few, but not as many as uh, there could be or should be uh, or are, and there's a high demand. So being the only one in the whole Middle East, it was very hard for me to really do um, sustained counseling with a lot of uh, soldiers. So I would go to Iraq, for instance, and be in Baghdad for a couple of days, and then be able to speak to some soldiers who would tell me then about their difficulties of dealing with it. And I would have to, you know, just put a Band-Aid on it mm -hmm. because I had to leave again the next day or in two days. Then I wouldn't see them for half a year. Um, so it was very difficult. I think that was a, a very challenging time. Um, but again, those soldiers could have gone to their own chaplain. Just mm -hmm. sometimes in those cases when it is a very personal issue, they may want to, they, they may feel more comfortable speaking to a rabbi. So it was difficult. Of, of course, what was very difficult too was just the family separation mm -hmm. from all these uh, deployed soldiers. That was probably the number one issue that uh, people were suffering from. So how did, how did you maintain your faith? through what was going on there, through your own separation from your own family, uh, through your own separation from the conventions of what would be religious practice. If you were to lose aspects of that, if you were to struggle to raise your own faith within you, you would certainly be in battle when it comes to the task at hand, namely ministering to, to the soldiers. How did you maintain that, Rabbi, and what informed that? What, what gave you that grounding no matter what? So. Wherever I went, um, it was actually very nice because my endorsing agency, they sent me a Sefer Torah. It was very small, this size, but a beautiful kosher Sefer Torah that I put in my backpack. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, wherever I went, you know, even if I would see just one or two Jewish soldiers, I would, you know, pull out the Sefer Torah and say, come, let's read a couple of verses from the Torah portion. And uh, I would have services. I would also, you know, we would do like delayed bar mitzvahs for the soldiers uh, on the camp. If I would stay for a Shabbat, I would practice with them. And a lot of soldiers didn't have bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs. So we just would do a celebration together. We just tried to create some kind of a... a uh, home away from home, a synagogue away from home. We had Torah studies. Mm -hmm. so, so it was, you know, I, I, of course, sustained myself with, uh, with my faith and uh, the mission at hand. You know, when you're in a mission, as you probably know very well, one becomes very focused. And, uh, you know, if you just do that well, everything else kind of falls into place. And the politics of the battlefield that were going on back in the United States, those didn't impact upon you or, or did you feel those present? Not really, no, no. I, I don't, uh, I can't say that I felt those, those issues. I mean, it was a difficult time, of course, the war had been going on. Um, so I haven't, uh, I can't say that. I had an interesting event uh, that didn't have to do with politics necessarily, but I think it, it's worthwhile mentioning just to give you a little bit of the mm -hmm. atmosphere. Um, so on my last um, trip to Afghanistan, just before I was done with my tour of duty, I decided to go to Afghanistan and uh, just to stay for a couple of days to visit some people there and to give them a little bit of you know, and a little strength. Uh, so I came there and I was, it was in the middle of Afghanistan. It was a difficult time. And uh, you know, visiting troops, I was about to go back. It was a short trip. It was supposed to be a short trip. And I went back to Bagram Airfield to fly back to Kuwait. I did my Shabbat service there. And on Friday evening, I was sitting at the table, did Kiddush with everyone. There was a lot of food. Believe me, there are amazing organizations in America. They send more food than we have soldiers. It's incredible. Uh, they're, they're amazing. We just got a whole um, shipment actually today for Pesach that I just unpacked. Right. So I was sitting there in... Uh, in Bagram, at Bagram Air Force Base in, in Afghanistan, doing Kiddush, we were singing together with the folks, having a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, Onik Shabbat. And I see my chaplain assistant, because in America, chaplains don't uh, bear weapons. So we have a chaplain assistant who has a weapon, and who's, he acts like, or she acts like a bodyguard, more or less, because we don't, we're not allowed to mm -hmm. deal with weapons. Mm -hmm. So my chaplain assistant comes over to the table, I'm just singing some Shabbat to Nigun or something, and he whispers in my ear, says, sir, I need to talk to you right now. Just translate that word Nigun for everybody. I like a hymn, like a little uh, singing along. You know, the word again in Hebrew. So you're singing this Nigun. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it now, though. But okay. <laughs> so he said, I need to talk to you right now. So I tell everyone, okay, keep singing. I get up, I say, well, what's going on, Sergeant? And he said, sir, I just got uh, word. We can't go back. We have to stay here in Bagram. We can't go back to Kuwait. I said, what do you mean? My flight is, what's what happened? So it is this, this is what happened. Um, at a base not far, actually, in, in the capital city of Kabul, there was a, a large American base, and uh, an IED there uh, had killed just on that day, on that Friday, two American soldiers. And the uh, commanding officer insisted that a Jewish chaplain would come to conduct the memorial service. So I was not allowed to leave. I was supposed to fly to Kabul. Now, this was a very tragic incident, accident, I mean, a terrorist attack, really. Um, it was a convoy of three vehicles. The front of the vehicle, there were four American uh, Christian soldiers. The middle vehicle, there were two American Jewish soldiers. And the last vehicle, we had three or four uh, Afghani soldiers in this convoy. And the middle vehicle was hit, and both were killed. Um, so. I came to this camp in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and I looked at everything. I found out who the people were, and I got a little bit of background and so forth, uh, trying to think how would I do a memorial service there. Um, it's a, a public event, really. So the senior chaplain 
not Jewish, the senior chaplain of the camp asked me to, to speak to him before the event, which was on the following day. He said, so chaplain, uh, glad you're here, glad you could make it. What, what are your intentions? How would you conduct this memorial service? So I told him, I said, well, sir, um, this is what I would do. I was my eulogy. I, I learned about the two people who were killed. Uh, I will talk about them. I will say a prayer in Hebrew, and uh, I will say a prayer in English, and uh, that's about it. So the chaplain looked at me and he said, well, Rabbi, I don't know if that's a good idea. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, tomorrow, it's not only your memorial service, but tomorrow is American Memorial Day, which means that we have the American ambassador there. We have the commanding officer of the Afghani, of the American forces in Afghanistan there, General McKernan. We have the um, chief of staff of the Afghani army, and we have a whole bunch of uh, Afghani politicians and other members of the cabinet. There will be about 500 people out there. And I don't know if that would go over so well if you, know, you did a Jewish prayer in front of all these people. So, you know, at the time I was just a, a captain, a lowly captain. So I was like, sir, yeah, but, uh, you know, why did, why, did, why did the general want me to come? And if you want me to just do a generic prayer, then you could have taken any chaplain. Mm -hmm. The chaplain would have, would have also uh, sufficed. I said, well, just think about it, chaplain. I'm not telling you not to do it, but just think about it. This is, you know, a very sensitive matter. Al Arabiya was filming and so forth. So uh, that evening I was a little, uh, you know, uneasy because I had a whole plan about how to do memorial service and I'd done them before. So I saw the commanding general of the camp that evening and I spoke to him and I said, sir, I need to talk to you about this. He said, what is it, chaplain? I said, sir, this is my plan. I want to do a Jewish prayer. I want to speak about these people. And uh, one of them, she was actually the youngest um, or the first air uh, graduate of the Air Force Academy who was killed in combat, 25 year old um, Rosalind Schulte. Uh, she was one month away from returning home and getting married uh, when she died in this uh, attack. So I said, Sir, this is my plan. And I'm not sure now what to do because I hear this is Memorial Day and there will be a whole bunch of uh, VIPs. So the general looked at me and he said, Chaplain, we are Americans, and we will honor our dead how Americans honor our dead. So you do what you would do to honor the dead. Just don't be over 15 minutes. <laughs> but I remember that. <laughs> Timing is key. Timing is key, Rabbi. What a story. I mean, you must have so many experiences over there that must make it very, very challenging to relate your time in deployment back in the homeland, whether that be in Germany, whether it be in uh, the United States or elsewhere. And, and in fact, speaking of, of the homeland, we have this concept of a Jewish homeland. And this is the last question I'll ask you before we take a couple of questions from the audience. And then I'd like to see if there's anything that we, we've not touched upon that you'd like to leave us with. You have a son who is a very dear friend of mine personally, and he's just a wonderful Jew named Josh. And Josh actually was very much involved with the United States Armed Forces as a child. I, I think the term is, a, is, is perhaps a bit of an army brat, right? That's what, they, that's what they call them. Along with your other children, of course, but Josh made Aliyah, and he served as a combat soldier on a voluntary basis. He volunteered for service as a lone soldier in the Israel Defense Forces. I want you to reconcile that experience with your experience and tell us a bit about how you feel, not as a chaplain, but as a father, as a Jew, as a, as a proud service member of the United States Armed Forces and as a Zionist. How, how does that relate to, to Josh's right. So I want to add to Josh, yes. Uh, also, I have a daughter, Abby, who joined the Israeli Air Force. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so that, that's tremendous. I think that's important that people know. So you have two children who joined the, the, uh, the, the Israeli Defense Forces. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And my oldest daughter lives in Israel with two children. So I have a lot of connections to Israel, of course. Um, 
You know, there is no um, discrepancy. I don't see that as a problem at all. And it became even clearer to me when I was the uh, chaplain at the Military Academy at West Point. Uh, at West Point, we have every year the delegations of IDF officers who come to, to speak, and uh, not to us necessarily, but to the, their American counterparts about a variety of military issues. And uh, at West Point, of course, we also have uh, the famous grave of General Mickey Marcus. Right. The right. famous uh, American graduate of West Point and World War II hero uh, who decided in 1947 to join Israel's War of Independence. And he's a West Point graduate. So as a Jew, as a very assimilated Jew, as a matter of fact, he decided that he had to fight for the independence of the state of Israel. Because he said, if we don't get the state, then the whole war, that's how he felt, the war was for nothing. We saved the Jews, whoever was left from the Holocaust, but if we don't get this state, um, then it was for nothing. That's how he felt. His wife was very upset, but he went anyway. And he went with the blessing of the State Department. All they asked was that he changes his name, right? So his name is David Stone. That was nom de guerre. They didn't want necessarily the name up front because he was kind of a famous personality. So he is buried at West Point at the military cemetery. And Mickey Marcus is really, he is the symbol, I think, of what we're talking about and of this incredible um, solidarity that American Jews, by and large, feel with Israel and vice versa. And it's, by the way, he's the only West Point graduate who is buried at West Point uh, who fell in the service of another army. Mm. Wow. And there's no discrepancy. You have the generals every year at West Point, there is a Mickey Marcus Memorial Day where the generals, three-star uh, generals and others come and honor Mickey Marcus. And they walk down to the grave and they put down a, a, a wreath and we, we laud his, his work. And uh, that's really, I think, it says everything about the American-Jewish uh, uh, connection. So when Josh decided to go to Israel, he told me, I need to, I want to join the IDF. Of course, you're worried as a father, like every father is, but I was proud of him. And the same when Abby decided to join the Air Force, although I'm uh, Army, not Air Force. <laughs> I was still, I was very proud of her, of course, to do that. So we, I think West Point um, really is a great symbol of this American uh, Jewish cooperation. And of course, we have uh, the, the, we had uh, Michael Oren there, which um, I don't know if we have time, I'll tell you another little anecdote about uh, that visit at West Point, which also was very significant. So I'll see if we can get to that. I'll see how much time we've got left. I, I want to give a quick shout out. You know, before we came on, I was rifling through some, some books and I, I have this book. It just reminded me of, of the story you told about your religious faith and, and how it was sustained. And this was given to me by my dear oldest brother, Jared Yaakov. And before I deployed to the Israel Defense Forces, he said, take this with you. This, is, uh, this includes the, the Tanakh. Uh, and he said that he inscribed it. You can see his inscription there. And he said, he actually wrote, hope is never lost, only abandoned. How foolish, this too will pass. And I think that that's very apropos for what everybody's facing now today in, in this difficult time. And he went on to say to my dear brother, on your journey now and in the future, keep the faith and with you this book safe, and that faith will keep you safe. All my love, your brother, Jared, Yaakov, Daniel. And then he wrote, P.S., be careful. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to acknowledge that because this traveled with me into Lebanon. I put this in my pouch, Shechem, which is a small pocket in the vests that combat soldiers wear and it really was a source of inspiration there in the battlefields and in, in the combat zones and it went with me to Hebron and so on and so forth so I, I really do identify with the message that you gave. I want to ask a couple of the audience questions if I may and I'm going to read them here. Many of them you've actually answered uh, in, your, in our conversation over the course of the conversation but let's see if I can bring up uh, just a couple of them, bear with me if you would. 
So we have we have a question from a U.S. Army veteran. Just bear with me. And he's based in Chicago. His name is David, and he actually traveled with us to Israel, Rabbi, during the Israel Law and Policy Tour for graduate students. He's a graduate of, of Harvard Law School, and he, he's written. I remember it. Uh, basic training at Fort Benning, the local Jewish community provided food and support to recruits of all faiths during services, which served as a way to bring in a lot of people that learned about the Jewish faith, many of whom had never met a Jewish person, let alone seen the community or attended the service. Is this something that happens at other bases? What can faith communities of any faith do to reach out to their local military and veteran communities? That's from David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point, David. I mean, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of communities like this at Fort Jackson and elsewhere. And David is bringing up a very important point that we have um, within the military community. Because a lot of people, just like uh, in David's case, may have never seen a Jew before. Uh, or will never see a Jewish service member before. So you really have a great responsibility to, uh, to leave with a good impression and to support people of all faiths. I remember when I was a basic training chaplain, um, we had sometimes a hundred uh, basic trainees come to Shabbat services. Why a hundred? Because we had pretty good food. I mean, we got uh, incredible support from the local community, and that was the only time when the trainees were allowed to, to go, and of course, uh, you know, that helps. It always helps, absolutely. So another question that I have comes from Rabbi Richard Kirsch, and he's an educator at the Ray Kushner Yeshiva High School in Livingston, New Jersey, which is obviously not in session at the moment, but they may very well watch this either live or, or by way of our postcast. And he asked the question, when you were deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan, did you ever have any interactions with the local populations? And if so, were they positive in nature. I'm going to ask you for a, a short answer there because I want to move on to something else. So I will just then add on to the story that uh, I mentioned before in Afghanistan when I did that service. Mm -hmm. I not only did the service and I did El Male Achamim in Hebrew, but I put on a talit because I knew that the parents of the, of the girl, uh, of, the, of the young woman who had passed away or had been killed, they would watch this. So I wanted them to see that a rabbi was there actually to uh, memorialize her daughter. And I can tell you that after this event, I walked out and there was this memorial tent and people were sitting down and having coffee and tea and all the um, Afghani chief of staff members, there were maybe 30 of them, three-star general, two-star generals, and very high-ranking officers who were all sitting there. And I was a captain at the time, that's very low uh, compared to them. I walked by and I remember that they all stood up when I walked by and the chief of staff, the Afghani army asked me to sit with them. It was after the service. And we started talking and we started you know, discussing questions of faith. We even talked about Israel. He looked at my name, he thought, well, maybe he has some Jewish background. So this was my only interaction, but it was incredibly positive. I think that the Afghanis had a very, they had a feeling for, for the, the Hebrew language, maybe for the melodies. So that was a positive, uh, memory that I can still cherish. One last question from the audience. It comes from a, a psychiatrist, Dr. Nomi, and she says, how do you comfort people who have no faith in God? Um, you know, that's difficult. That's, of course, a very difficult question, and I can't really uh, give you a simple answer to that. But let me say this, that I feel that my role as a chaplain is there to provide religious freedom to those who need it. But it's also there to protect those who don't believe from religious coercion. So I have to be, sometimes I have to step in to tell commanders, hey, sir, ma'am, you can't do this. Um, you know, not everyone is religious. It is very difficult. I mean, I do try to, um, you know, approach them in, in different ways, but, uh, I think that that question really requires a much longer answer than I, I, can, I can give at this point. I, of course, speak to them as well, and I would never turn anyone away. 
um, no atheist and no Muslim. I had a lot of Muslim soldiers who came to me because they felt I'm the next best thing that they have when there was no Muslim chaplain around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for taking the questions. Before, before I make a closing number of comments, a lot of people, Rabbi, are, are feeling the pressures of the current moment. They're enclosed within their homes, they're away from their workplaces, they're in their households, and there are a lot of tensions. There are also a lot of wonderful moments, but what's pervasive, regardless of the current circumstances or, or the particulars of any one individual circumstance, is a sense of uncertainty and perhaps a sense of foreboding. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's anything you'd like to share with us that can perhaps bring a Jewish chaplain's perspective and the perspective of Judaism to uplift not just our Jewish listeners, but frankly anybody who, who listens to this conversation. So yeah, definitely these are very trying times, really unprecedented times. Uh, um, and it's, it's um, our goal is to, to help each other and to uplift each other. Um, very strange times. We've started to do online services, uh, me and my colleagues, my Christian colleagues. But I think that at this stage at least, and we hope that this will end soon, but at this stage at least, on a personal level, this should give us an opportunity. We should see in a difficult situation an opportunity. I think that's a Jewish response. A difficult situation, um, even a bad situation, should be viewed as a moment of opportunity. We just have to find the opportunity. So. In, in our case right now, I think what we see is that a lot of things that seem to be indispensable and so important, and uh, we had to keep deadlines and write reports and work uh, in certain areas that now all of a sudden, from one day to the next, they don't matter anymore. All these things have fallen away. So what we are left with is the question, what? does matter. What actually matters in life? And maybe it wasn't all those things that we used to do before this happened, um, when we sometimes felt maybe I'm wasting my time or I'm not really doing what I'm supposed to do. Uh, it is a moment, it's like a pause, you know, like the Lord, the Almighty pushed a pause button and said, you know what, you have a chance now to recalibrate your life. It's almost like Shabbat. And I think as Jews, we know what Shabbat means because we're supposed to do that every week, to sit down, to turn off the phone, to turn off everything else, not to go to work and to think, how do I reconnect spiritually with God? Am I doing the right thing? How can I get better? That's the Jewish response. But I think it's a response that is valid for all humanity. Um, and... Uh, so really to think, you know, what, is, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with, you know, those years that you have here? What is really important to you? That's on a personal level. And I think on a global, more Jewish level, um, we could also look at it from this perspective that the Jewish collective response to a tragedy was never to blame the aggressor. When the temples were destroyed, it wasn't the blame for the Romans, but it was the introspection. The Jewish people asked themselves, what did we do wrong or what can we do better now that this happened? So again, I think as a people, as a global people even, have we done things maybe, has the global community failed in its care for the environment maybe uh, to go down that, that path? So I think the, Tragedy and, and the difficult times really, you know, cannot be denied. But I, I do take solace in the fact that unlike previous tragedies and previous difficult times, the Jewish people is in a different position today. And you mentioned it before. We're in a different position. In the past, there was always the fear, and we know it from the Middle Ages and so forth, that in the end, the Jews, the Jews would be blamed for whatever tragedy befell the world but we're in a different position because of the state of Israel. Today, the free world, and I'll call it the free world, maybe that's an outdated term, the free world is looking to Israel for solutions and to Israel for leadership 
to solve this, this difficult situation. And the world is looking at Israel as, as this light and beacon of light. So I take solace in those two things, in the personal and in the global um, perspective. Well, Rabbi, thank you so very much for giving us of your time. I'm sure you've got plenty to be on with where you are, but I think that every Jew who's on this call and also members of other faiths who hold the Jewish state and the Jewish people close to their hearts is standing a little bit taller as a result of seeing you in your uniform and learning about your experiences in the military, in the defense of the great United States of America and the absolute reconcilability of that ethos within you with your Zionism and your friendship towards the Jewish people as a member of the Jewish people and ministering in that vein. Thank you so very much for being with us today. Uh, on a personal level, you know that your family is very dear to my family. We absolutely love and adore each and every member of your family and we wish them safety and health and well-being during these times. And of course, these times have come not to stay, but to pass, and pass they will. And our goal is to emerge from them stronger than ever before. And I'm confident that we can do so, and you, in your capacity, will take a direct hand in bringing about that outcome. So thank you on behalf of me and on behalf of my colleague, Rosita Panini, the Chief Operating Officer of our organization, and of course, I must acknowledge my great and powerful colleague, Mr. Alan Langer, our international coordinator, for bringing all of this together. So from us to you, thank you so very much. And if we are in a wartime, 14, as some people say, let us all remember, shalom aleno, that peace will yet come and prevail over all of us. Thank you very much, Rabbi, and have a Shabbat Shalom. And that concludes this Miriam Institute podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.